Iowa State University Extension and Outreach puts the university's research to work throughout the state. We work with farmers to conserve our land. We inspire youth to be leaders through science and technology. We educate families on making healthy choices. We are there when a disaster strikes. And we help businesses improve their bottom line. We're committed to Iowans and to Iowa's future. We're Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. But before we get started, as always, we like to do a little overview of what is Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, just to make sure people know out there. And as it says on the screen, my name is Krista Regeneter, and I'm the Muskegon County Extension Director. And we're going to be talking mostly about Art of Gardening today. And just as a reminder, March 9th, it's coming up shortly. We're going to be thinking spring as this polar vortex comes. Um, 8.30 to 3.30 at Muscatine Community College, and you can register and find out more information uh, at the eicc.edu website and just search Art of Gardening. But before we get to that, we're gonna talk just a little bit about what is Iowa State University Extension and Muscatine County Extension. So who are we? We are actually, um, we've been around since 1913 here in Muscatine County, and we are an extension of Iowa State University. And we, we all work together, every county has an extension office, and what we want is a strong Iowa. So we work in all 99 counties, we also have state staff, and we have regional staff, and we have county staff, and basically what we do is we take the research and education from Iowa State University and bring it to each of our communities in the ways that our community needs it. And we do this in four different areas. We do it in agriculture and natural resources, human sciences, 4-H youth development, and community and economic development. So in each of those areas, we have programs and partnerships and services helping Iowans access research-based information. And you can see different ways to connect with us. You can visit the Extension website. If you want to go right to Muscatine, just put that little backslash Muscatine on there. Like our Facebook page, and you'll hear about all of our upcoming events and things like that. You can also sign up for our newsletter, and all you got to do is send me an email at kristar at iastate.edu, and I'll add you to our monthly newsletter list where we also send out all of our upcoming events and information about what's happening with Muscatine County Extension and Outreach. So that is a little start. So we talked about ag and natural resources as one of our areas, and under that we have master gardeners. So Rachel is a Muscatine County Master Gardener. Rachel, what does it mean to be a Master Gardener? Wow, okay, well, I'm Rachel Horner Brackett, and I've lived in Muscatine now for about 15 years. And I had heard of Master Gardeners at places like the Farmer's Market. If you um, see different events like Art of Gardening that occur around town, I knew that those were um, sponsored through the Master Gardeners. And when I looked into it more, I'm an educator by profession. So uh, I teach anthropology. And I didn't realize at first that Master Gardeners, a lot of it is about volunteerism. And a lot of it is about educating um, other people about gardening techniques and food security and different methods for you know not just improving your yard, but improving kind of the, the proverbial community's yard. So I got in, uh, involved, I guess it's been two years ago. Yeah, and so now I'm an official master gardener. Uh, there is about a year of training um, where you take uh, classes in the evening and learn all about everything from what insects are local pests to what kind of trees are growing in the Muscatine Arboretum to what kind of plants you can grow in your vegetable garden. I mean, it's very, it's Thorough. great training. It's yeah. basically a college level course it in is. horticulture. It is, yeah. it's a, like intro to horticulture. So I really enjoyed it um, and I, I learned a ton and it's been really fantastic getting to know other local gardeners and, and local volunteers, people who are interested in giving back to the community and it's just a really great group of folks. So 
other people should join too. Um, <laughs> we have a good time. Well, and I think you hit the nail on the head because one of the most important things about Master Gardeners to me is that they're volunteer educators. Yeah. That it's not about going out. Sometimes I get calls from people and they'll say, hey, can I have a Master Gardener come help me in my yard? And that is yeah. not what Master Gardeners not quite what do. what we do, no. <laughs> no, but they, they get this extensive training. And on top of that 40 hours of training, there's a 40 hour internship where you have to donate 40 volunteer okay. hours before you are officially a master yep. gardener, which Rachel has done all of that. Yeah. Um, but it is about giving back to the community. And just like we just talked about what is extension, sure. we're an extension of Iowa State and master gardeners are kind of that arm that in your local community, um, master gardeners are at the farmer's market. So they're often down there. If you have a question, you can bring your plant sample and say, what's going on here yeah. kind of thing. Um, it, we've had... We can try to help. You can try. <laughs> or we'll know where to look. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, it's not always about knowing the answer. It's about knowing where to look. Yeah. I think that's important too. Yeah. But we've done presentations for um, nursing homes. I shouldn't say we. You all have <laughs> done presentations for nursing homes, yeah. um, Girl Scout and Boy Scout yeah. troops. I've worked with 4-H. You have things at the fair with Bucket Brigade. There's um, the Zoo Garden was a Master Gardener project, the Arboretum. Zoo Garden. I mean, huge plant, gems. We do a plant sale every May. Um, yes. <laughs> local yeah, plants. Art of Gardening. And Art of Gardening. Which is so. an educational opportunity for the community and people to come for one day and soak mm -hmm. up some of that knowledge. And the neat thing about Art of Gardening is we have Muscatine County Master Gardeners uh -huh. presenting, like you, but we also have Master Gardeners that come from Lynn County and surrounding areas in addition to other experts in gardening and conservation and things like that. Yeah, it's a super fun day. I, I went to Art of Gardening before I was a Master Gardener and you learn so much. I mean, they just really cram a lot of information into that couple of hours. So, and you get lunch. It is a good lunch, It's a right? good lunch yeah, and exactly. there's vendors and it's, it's just a fun afternoon. It gets you ready for the garden season. So yeah. for everyone else who is out here as a gardener, this is the time of year when we are the most antsy. So yes. ready to get Be rolling. Ready for it to stop freezing. <laughs> yes. And one thing I will add about Master Gardeners before I ask you about your sessions that you're going to be leading mm -hmm. is that Master Gardeners, actually, we are changing how we're going to be doing the training this yeah. coming uh, fall. And typically it was um, live stream broadcasts from Iowa State University with different professors and we could type in questions. But you sat in a room and you kind of watched the, the lectures. Mm -hmm. And this year we're going to change to a flipped classroom concept where you'll get to watch pre-recorded lectures at home in your PJs, drinking your favorite beverage. <laughs> um, but then afterwards, we will have hands-on sessions where folks will get to do things that will um, coordinate. So if it's on soils, if the lecture's on soils, then we may go out and, and get dirty and, yeah. and or have an agronomist Soil come and talk about. And, yes, yeah. and like the different soils of Muscatine County, what's different here with our yep. sandy soils in the south yeah. and that kind of thing. So we're really excited. We have not released any dates or anything like that. Rachel's on the team that's going to be helping us I plan am. that <laughs> um, with Kathy Altmeyer. So um, in the next couple of months, we'll have information out about how you can join us and become a master gardener this fall. Yeah. But let's talk more about Art of Gardening. Sure. You are going to be doing two sessions. I am doing two sessions. I'm super excited about one of them. I'm excited about both of them, but okay. one of them strikes my fancy, right, right. I have to admit. I'm but ready. the first one you're going to do, and we always like to tell our viewers, and you can go back and look at the Muscatine um, Channel 9 Access YouTube channel if you want to watch our previous two episodes. And But each time we've kind of said when yeah. you have yours. So you're going to be in session two from the 1010 to 11, and your first one is extending the season winter gardening cold frames. And I will tell you, I don't know what a cold frame is. <laughs> so tell I would love to tell you more. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, like I said before, this is really the time of year when a lot of gardeners in the Midwest, um, and certainly as we're looking outside right now, everything just looks completely dead mm -hmm. and feels like spring is never going to get here. But for people who are um, especially interested in starting their own seeds and starting things um, kind of literally from the ground up, now is actually the time when you want to start thinking about what am I going to do in my garden in the next season. And 
I, um, I spent a year and change uh, actually living in Italy, and I lived and worked in um, an organic farm there that used awesome. hoop houses extensively. And hoop houses are essentially, you know, kind of a raised a raised bed, and they're covered. So it's not quite as, as permanent as, say, a, a greenhouse where it's going to be, the temperature is going to be controlled. But one of the things I learned about there was how um, they managed to start plants and extend their seasons um, to grow for market and for, for local consumption. And obviously, the uh, temperature in Italy is a little bit different uh, than what we're dealing here um, with in the Midwest, especially in a year like this one. And when I got back, I started doing some more research about how I could try to do this um, affordably uh, in my own backyard. And one of the first books that I came across um, was this one. It's called The Winter Harvest Handbook, and it's by Elliot Coleman. And this is a, a great book because he really is uh, talking about how even, you know, in w right now in, uh, you know, where we're at, we're in zone five. So the USDA has different agriculture zones based on how hot and cold it gets. And this- which they uh, might need to be changing soon. Which they might need to be changing soon, <laughs> but at least for now we're still in zone five. Yeah. And you know, it, it does get cold here and it gets hot. Mm -hmm. So we do deal with some real temperature extremes. And so does the author of, of this particular book. And one of the things that he really emphasized was how to, um, without you know, heating a building or, or having all of those extra added inputs, what are we able to grow, um, even with just a very simple kind of layered system? And f to make a long story short, this is a great book if you are a small-scale farmer who wants to do large-scale production of things like spinach and radishes and lettuces and other cold season crops. So after that, I kind of took it to the next level because I was like, well, I'm not you know, a major farmer, right? I'm not doing this to, to produce, so it's just this, for my family. This resource is made, made more for the bigger. Yeah, that's okay. made a little bit more for the, the wider scale farmers. He's got some good ideas that I'm going to share um, during my presentation on um, next Saturday. But what I got really interested then in is I kind of went down an internet wormhole, as oh, often happens. <laughs> so easy. And I discovered something called winter sewing. And winter sewing is an idea um, that came about in like the early 2000s or so, but people have been doing this for a really long time. I just never had a name for it. And winter sewing operates on the idea that really right now in nature, what's happening is that especially seeds that need to be what we call cold stratified. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever gotten a, a packet of seeds and it says you have to you know, nick, nick the seed or soak it overnight, that nature actually does that for you. <laughs> if it's outside and it's going through that freeze and thaw cycle, okay. it's going to be able to do that on its own. That's why sometimes, too, if you're, say, trying to start parsley from seed, that'll say, you know, keep it in the freezer for a few weeks before. Um, and really what you can do is if you start planting seeds in covered containers right now, you can actually start setting them outdoors, and they are going to follow more of that pattern of nature. So. If, for example, you have a vegetable garden where already you see very, very early in the spring maybe arugula is coming up mm -hmm. or your chives are coming up and you think, how in the heck is it doing it you know, this early? It's still so cold out, it's still freezing at night. But by selecting the right crops and starting them, especially in different containers, um, it's actually, you can do it. Okay. So that's and what I, I'll be I teaching think you. Maybe do you have a container? To I do. I have some samples. So she, I, she doesn't come empty. I did. Folks. So I brought my props. Um, so I think we all realize, you know, having a greenhouse. It would be amazing for most gardeners, but also it's a lot of expense. Yes. So with winter sowing, um, as I started learning more, you can start in little mini greenhouses that you make out of things that are probably in your recycling bin. So the idea here is, you know, you can take a, a nice plastic container, a milk jug. Um, I brought this too. This is, you know, something that yeah. I got lettuce in. You know, this will mm -hmm. work as well. But you want to, you know, cut drainage holes. Um, if you have uh, someone handy that has a very small drill bit, mm -hmm. that works really well. Um, and what you're going to do is you're just going to cut the top off. Okay, you're going to put some soil in there and open up the top. You're going to leave that off for, you know, the airflow, airflow. to move in and out. And you can start your seeds in here and literally set them out in the snowbank, <laughs> out in your yard. And as soon as nature really tells these plants that it's time, they're going to start to grow. And they're not going to get frozen at night because they're covered. And because you put the top back yeah, on. You put after the you top back yes. on. You tape it on. Oh, you tape it on. You okay. can tape it back on. And you want to be sure to label 
Your containers, um, I've had some interesting surprises. Makes sense. Where, you're where like, I forgot. This? Yeah, I learned the hard way you should really label them on the bottom where it's not going to get washed off. That's a, that's a even hot Sharpies? Tip. Yeah, even <laughs> Sharpies, or they oh, fade no. in the sun. So essentially, that, that's going to be part of what I talk about in my presentation is, you know, what plants work the best? Um, how do we set up these containers? Where should I put them in my yard? And then I'll also be talking about some cheap and definitely budget-friendly ways to set up what we call a cold frame, which is essentially another form of a mini greenhouse um, that I've made several with old windows. And my husband's helped me do uh, this using old window panels. Absolutely. And <laughs> I'll get my, my junk out of the way here. Um, where you can almost create, you know, kind of a little greenhouse in your yard to, to start plants as well. So, so that's what the cold frame is, is with windows. It can be, or other forms of glass. Some people use plastic sheeting. There's, okay. there's options. I stuff. am very, so we, I did get some, <laughs> some questions sure. to, for you, but you have answered some of them. Because oh, one of them was, is extending the season pretty expensive? So it doesn't have to be. From what you're saying, this no. is, could be a pretty nope. budget friendly. And yeah. we know seeds are cheaper seeds than Seeds are definitely plants. cheaper. And especially, I think, if you want to grow maybe some more unusual varieties, mm -hmm. things that you don't necessarily see um, at the different garden centers. And, and we have fantastic garden centers around here. It's yes, definitely not hard to find great plants around here. But if you want to try, you know, maybe some of the heritage breeds or the heirloom breeds, um, or you're a seed trader, uh, that's one great way to start. Start it out. Yeah. Well, let's see. I mean, so one of the questions was, because you're talking about extending the growing season. Mm -hmm. So which end of the growing season is usually dressed? You know, you're talking about starting early. Yeah. Are you going to talk at all about any tips of, of keeping it going Going longer? into the fall. You can use these same kinds of grow houses or um, things like the, the cold frame to extend your growing season into the fall as well. I've harvested things like leeks and kale, um, different kinds of greens, you know, well almost into Christmas um, just by having them covered. And snow comes in around them, it gets cold. But just having, you know, maybe even 10 degrees difference um, really makes a big difference. Keeps them Big going. difference and keeps them going. So it's pretty cool. I'm really, it, it's funny. I just have to tell you what's coming to my mind is we read lots of books at my house uh -huh. with my kids and there's a, a really great Winnie the Pooh story where Rabbit's garden is threatened by oh, the no. freeze and like everybody comes with Poor their, rabbit. their Bring your pots sheets. Yeah. and puts them on top of it and, and the yeah. Pooh like, sacrifices his honey pot. Oh and that's no, what I'm yes, that would work perfectly actually. <laughs> In I terms of extending your season, yes. <laughs> I don't get They you. were on the right track. Yeah. They, they were, they yes. Were. Well, okay, that sounds awesome. I think that, so come to Art of Gardening. As, as we joked about, you can come to our donation gardening on session one if you want to learn about that, which we previewed oh, on our last episode. Oh, very good. And then session two, you have your extended the growing season. Um, but the next one, I have to tell you, I've, I've talked about the next one every single time because <laughs> I'm so interested in it. But I have to double check where, okay, so session three, session which three. is after lunch, after the Stump the Expert session, um, plants that have changed history. I feel like you should tell us a little bit about what sure. you do since <laughs> Absolutely, I'm not. I'm not just. This. I'm not just coming up with this out of nowhere. <laughs> um, so I teach, as I mentioned before, I teach anthropology and archaeology, um, actually up in the Quad Cities at Blackhawk College. And one of um, the things that I, I talk a lot about, especially in my archaeology courses, is really the the fundamental shift that happened in human history when people started to settle down and raise plants, uh, as opposed to being hunters and gatherers. Mm -hmm. And we really have a handful of plants that we have domesticated and cultivated that have absolutely reshaped everything about what it meant to live in a group. Um, the minute that you're able to grow enough crops that you can store them mm -hmm. and, and have a surplus like that, it really changed the entire course of human history. So I... I mean, literally, I could go on for an entire semester about this. So it's going to be hard for me to, to pick just a few. What comes to my mind is corn. Yep. I, corn. I mean, I would think that's one of the... Corn will be on the list. Yeah, it would be okay. a main one. Yeah. And we, we can't tell all the secrets. I can't tell all the secrets. You have to come to the session. But I will say that corn it. and its ancestor, Teosinte, uh, oh. will be on the agenda. Okay. okay. So... Um, Talk about a little bit of like how you've researched. I mean, sure. do you have a class that you incorporate some of this information yeah, into? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, so we do talk a little bit about, you know, how do we know in the, even the archeological record, how can we tell 
when a plant you know, isn't just some wild plant that people happen to live next to versus they were actively really trying to cultivate it. And while I'm not sure I'll talk quite about this as much in my, in yeah. my talk, um, there's things that you can look for in terms of storage containers, in terms of um, harvesting tools. Once you start to find things like great big mortars that are like grinding mm -hmm. stones, as, as hunter-gatherers, humans are usually pretty nomadic. You're not going to be kind of hauling that around with you uh, as you're out and about. So those are some pretty good indicators. Yes. And certainly on the, the more um, scientific or horticultural side of it, there's also changes that happen to the plants themselves. And uh, we can find fossilized seeds, and they have found you know, things that are thousands of years old still in storage jars. It's incredible the wow. kinds of data that some of these archaeologists have located. So yeah, that's it's fascinating. So, it's so cool. Okay. <laughs> so one of the questions that we, we had submitted uh -huh. was, have there been drastic changes in plants or in the methods of gardening since ancient history? And I feel yeah. like yes, but yeah. like... No, absolutely. <laughs> You know, and I always say we need to be sure to also give our, our ancestors credit. I mean, they were smart. They, you know, we look back all around the world. People had figured out different ways of managing water and managing land and um, figuring out, you know, terracing to grow crops in places that they wouldn't have been able to, um, bringing in, you know, irrigation systems. All of these things are, you know, we got to give our, our forebears credit. Yeah, um, this is such a great, to me, a plug to to visit national parks. Oh, because yeah. Because I, I remember I went to the New Gila, the yeah. national forest down in New Mexico, Gila National mm -hmm. Forest in New Mexico, and seeing the cliff dwellings. Unreal. And just, mm -hmm. I mean, really, it was like the ingenuity of Pretty people brilliant. to find yeah. places to live and find yeah. shelter and community. Yep. Yep. It's really amazing, and we have a fabulous national park system that do. I wish I had more time and money. Yeah. Like my dream is to go to every. To go to the parks. Oh yeah, mm. I, t I took a class in college about national parks, and I remember the, oh, wow. the quiz at the, or the, yeah. the final at the end was just showing pictures and like having to know where they oh, were. Oh wow, it was it was pretty intense. You're but, ready to like take those well, trips. It was a little while ago. I'm <laughs> um, I don't know if I remember all of it right now, but That's <laughs> but great. That's it was great. a great class, and yeah. I just think we do have some really great national parks that that share that history yeah. of you know our ancestors yeah. and and, well, and and how humans have lived side by side with nature and and how we've reshaped nature in some yeah. ways and you know certainly we wouldn't have seven billion people on the planet right now without the agricultural techniques that we have exactly. today so it's certainly changed over time absolutely but you know i always say Give, give our ancestors credit too. They were figuring out important things. Yes. So. Well, that leads Thanks. right into an, another question of, are plants still changing? Oh, wow, yeah. Oh, yeah. History. I oh, mean. Future. Future so, history. Future history today. That is an interesting. <laughs> changing future history future today. Future history right now, yes. <laughs> as we move forward. Um, you know, certainly one of the things that, that comes up a lot is, one of the biggest changes, I think, is that humans have switched you know in the last thousand couple thousand years to relying on all kinds of different plants that were available in the wild to really only a few yes um, yeah. the majority of our calories as humans today just come from you know about 10 different crops and we we've really limited um, our sources of our food now that being said also our agronomy has gotten much more sophisticated mm -hmm. and our ability to grow those things has gotten much more sophisticated um, so I think it's always going to be changing, you know, as our, our population um, needs change and our and our tastes change as well, and what we want to be consuming. So yeah, it feels yeah. like to me right now that there is a um, a wave of rediscovering yeah. some lost things. Like, and I, how do you say it? For the ACI, the A. Oh, acai. <laughs> is it really acai? acai? Yeah. Oh, wow, that is not what I would have yeah, said. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that, the berry, like I've uh -huh. heard more and, and mm -hmm. more about that, but I, it, so it sounds sure. like, you know, it's something that was probably been there forever been that we're Brazil a long time. Yeah. rediscovering and yeah. putting back into our diet. Not to be too obnoxious, but I, I lived in Brazil for a while. I don't know if you knew this. Wow. <laughs> no, we could have a whole other show about know, where has Rachel I know, lived. Where I, but this is the beauty of anthropology. You get to do all oh, kinds of cool yeah. stuff. But um, when I was in Brazil, this was, I mean, fifth, oh gosh, it's been at least 15 years ago. And when I was there, I, I was given, you know, acai berries in juice, and I had never even heard of it. And there were so many fruits, Krista, in Brazil that I had 
never heard of that I, you know, it's like these don't make it to the United States and we don't drink this juice and there's a lot of really delicious things that, um, you know, we just, they either don't transport well. Don't, that's or, a lot of it, don't you think? Yeah, is the tra how long? Yeah, how long can they be exactly. before they're perishable yeah, and the they transport? Don't, and they don't grow anywhere nearby here. So I mean, it was a really, it was a cool experience, but it was also very eye-opening. You know, coming from the Midwest and you know, kind of this amazing bread basket that we have here in the Midwest to having these very tropical plants all around and and different kinds of foods and and fruits mm. and vegetables was a pretty cool experience. That wonderful. But yeah, I remember when I first learned about acai, it was one of those, it was about the same time that um, quinoa was oh, getting yeah. very popular. Mm -hmm. And so that was also, you know, a South American crop that, you know, people are, are getting more adventurous in some mm -hmm. ways. So and recognizing the different grains and how yeah. our bodies interact with yeah, food absolutely. and all of that. There's a ton of interest in that right now. So I'll probably, I'll probably talk a little bit about that in the presentation is, you know, there's kind of this movement towards maybe what we would consider a paleo diet. Um, and no matter what we do right now, it's never going to be a truly paleo diet unless you're literally outside hunting all of your own grass-fed meat and mm -hmm. finding things. But there are some, there's some arguments for some of the health benefits as well. So we'll, we'll talk about those. So you, t so I mentioned corn and you said that's yeah, on your absolutely. list as, as a vegetable plant. Yep. Is there any fruits on your list? Well, I will be talking about the tomato if you okay, want to be which very is true. specific. Yes, I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about. I'm not a master gardener, but I know yes, that. <laughs> uh, yes, technically a fruit. And I'm actually going to talk about sugarcane, which is oh. one of the top crops that's grown today and used. And what a lot of people don't realize is sugarcane was actually the first crop to be widely grown using um, slave labor and plantation systems yeah. and fundamentally shaped. Um, the middle passage for a lot of people that you know were brought here very much against their, their will. will. So yeah. we're going to talk um, a little bit about that because certainly the taste for sugar um, really fundamentally shifted human populations. In well, a lot of ways. and especially the American diet. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Like I was listening to something the other day about how you can take a, a, a bratwurst that's from the United States and a bratwurst in Germany, and the sugar content yeah. is completely different. Let's and put sugar in it. We have just More salt. yeah cultivated this taste <laughs> that wants sugar yeah. and salt. We like it sweet, so for better or for worse. So those will be at least three. Okay. That I'll be talking so about. one other question: <laughs> Are is there going to be any non-edible, like, or will it all be fruits and vegetables? That's a great question. I think you know another, a couple of plants that are widely cultivated today um, that are also native to the Americas are cotton and tobacco. I was wondering about cotton. And cotton and tobacco are two other crops that you know also fed into that plantation oh, system. Oh, for sure. And also have definitely changed the way that we live our lives um, mm -hmm. you know rather you know either through smoking or through our clothing yeah. and, and things along those lines so I, I haven't totally decided if I'm going to include too much about those but okay I'm gonna it'll be a nice it'll be a nice sampler so of you have plants to come the world. to find yes. out which ah, is we're gonna have fun. In, yeah. and is it top 10 is that what you're doing I don't uh, know if I felt like I heard you say that or if I made it up I think you made it up but that, you know it's not a bad system I like it I like, I like the way you're thinking. <laughs> it just comes sometimes. You're not really sure about that. So if you would like to learn more about plants that have changed history, then you can join us at Art of Gardening on March 9th, 2019, just in case you're watching this way off in the future sometime. Yeah. Um, and here is the Art of Gardening registration page. So you can see it's $45. That includes four workshops that you get to pick um, through different options and lunch and a Stump the Expert. Plus, we'll have vendors there. So you can see um, the first session starts at 9 o'clock to 9.50. Is there anything? So you're not going to be presenting her. So what have you picked oh my gosh. during this time? So it's really hard to choose because every year I look at these and then I want to always go to all of them. This is my problem. Yes. Um, so, you know, when you are looking at <laughs> being a homeowner, there are some really wonderful classes about, you know, reusing your space. And I've always been kind of into the landscaping ones, okay. personally. Yeah. Those always excite me. But that yeah. and growing food. So that landowner conservation options and strategies, I think, is it looks like a neat yes. one. And I have heard Ron talk before, and he is mm -hmm. so good at what he does. Now, and, and Ron, I will say there's a misprint. Ron is not a Scott County Master Gardener. No, he is with the Fish and Wildlife yes. <laughs> Service Oops. with the Liza, Liza County. Um, and so 
we'll get that right when he comes there. <laughs> but if you go down a little bit, the other one that I thought was interesting in session one is gourd jewelry. Did you see oh, that one? Oh, <laughs> you know, I knew I was on the committee when we were finding people to participate in this, and we were really, really looking for more activities where we could have hands-on, um, because everyone loves hands-on. It's always fun to take something home and to, to really get in there and do stuff. And I knew that the gourd lady was coming, the gourd jewelry person was coming, and I think it's missing from the website, too. I just noticed, oh, so GF, we'll have to look at that. Um, so in session two, so obviously you want people to sign up. I mean, oh, no, I'm looking in session cold three. frames that is, is going to be a lot of fun. Yes. Um, but as you can see, there's lots of options. And, you know, I know pruning is always very popular. Mm -hmm. Charles Rickey, if you have not met him, uh -huh. is... Amazing. A, a plant genius, a tree genius, mm. if you will. He has so much knowledge and experience in this area, um, not to be missed. And sure. what's exciting, and this is not, the flyer isn't even done yet about uh, this, but we actually also are going to be bringing um, Patrick O'Malley down to do a fruit oh, tree pruning fantastic. workshop at the Arboretum later in awesome. March. So some more information will be coming out. So if you can't get to that pruning session just awesome. because... Um, you're choosing Too to go choices. to extending the, the <laughs> growing season, there will be another op option to learn about pruning. And then, like we said, a guy and a girl caters lunch. It's lunch always is great. delightful. Yes. And so you can pick up a Art of Gardening brochure. At, um, you can pick one up at the Extension Office. They've seen them all over the place at the community college here. Mm -hmm. um, they're around town, different places. So you can register. There's a registration form right in here. Or you can register online, as it showed on the slide over there. So either way works. But we're, uh, the sooner you register, the more likely that you will get the workshop that you choose. So I encourage people... We really are encouraging people to try to register by February, I want to say 28th. Yep, deadline. But we, we do take late registrations every year, but sometimes you don't get into the class. If that one's full, you might get your second choice in a session. So sign up today. Um, a couple other Master Gardener things that are coming up that are open to the public. We do something called the Winter Webcast Series, um, and we also do a Summer Webcast Series. And these are just, they're pre-recorded lectures, is that a fair yeah. um, kind of thing, Presentations. by different folks up at Iowa State University. And so last week we had the limited space gardening, which was a really interesting really one. Good. Yeah, and so February 26th, and these last two are going to be at the Extension Office, we're having one called Engaging New Audiences. So it's about ways to get people involved, non-traditional folks in, involved in gardening, because mm -hmm. we need to keep people yeah. coming through the system. And then I'm excited, March 5th is going to be Managing Vegetable Pests. And this one will provide organic, weed-free vegetable growing tips to reduce pests and attract beneficial insects. The question we get the most every year is, what do I do about fill in the blank? The last couple of years, it's been those... Japanese beetles. Oh, Japanese things. beetles, mm -hmm. yes. And, uh, and so the, we'll be talking about things and like And a that. lot of people, I don't know if many folks realize that people can bring insects or they can bring questions to the extension office. Anytime. And we will, again, help find the answer. Yes. It doesn't mean we always know the answer right away, but we'll, we'll help find. And the stink bugs have been something lots of people have asked about. And the stink bugs are probably going to get worse before they get better based on trends in the East Coast. Okay, because it's funny because some people are, I saw some um, some things on Facebook, and, and this is a great uh -oh. point, that said that this polar vortex potentially is freezing the, the stink bugs, but they're in my house. So first of all, I know that that's not true. They live in the walls. Yeah, <laughs> but I also think this is a great time to say the difference between extension information and, and getting information from your master gardeners and reading an article on Facebook is you don't yes. always know where that information is coming from. And things that come from Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, you know you can trust because it is from the university. These are professional etymologists, people who study bugs exactly. for a living. They definitely have more experience than, than any of us. Um, although yeah. I, I have a, quite a bit of experience killing those Japanese oh, beetles yeah. on my roses. But <laughs> they're, they're 
in my house. About as much as I can get. I have one son who wants me to kill one, and I have one son oh, who wants me to spare it. it. <laughs> like, what are you going to do? So, but, yeah. <laughs> so um, you can join us for those winter webcasts, again, February 26th and March 5th. Both of them are from 6 to 7. They're free and open to the public. You're welcome just to show up. and. We'd love to see you. Yeah. So join, join in. Yeah. Um, and then we also are partnering, Master Gardeners is partnering with the Mustang Community Garden Association to do a growing season kickoff on March 30th. So let's say you go somewhere tropical on March 9th and you're not able to join us for Art of Gardening, or even if you are, you can also join us on March 30th at the Discovery Center from 9 to 11. We're going to have a Master Gardener talking about tomatoes, growing tomatoes. Um, Everyone's disease favorite. Disease-free yes. tomatoes, too. And then we're also gonna have another master gardener talking about soils and composting. So just kind of a growing season kickoff. We'll also be highlighting donation gardening because that is a cornerstone of some of the work we're doing with Extension. Um, and we're inviting different organizations in town that d have dealings with either conservation or gardening. So maybe if you're looking to get involved in the community, this would be a great way just to visit and talk with folks and learn about yep. Muscatine has got some great things going on, folks, but you got to make a little effort and get out there and get yep. involved. And Come meet them. I, you know, I'll say I have met so many people through Master Gardening that I would have never come across otherwise through yeah. my other things that I do, and I'm a fairly active person, yes. I think. So it's a, it's a great place to meet new folks and to do projects with like-minded people and to get involved. So. And if you're a learner, if you're, if yeah. you're a learner, a lifelong <laughs> learner, you're it's a, a great nerd. opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Come on um, down. Yeah, so I think those are all the different events that we wanted to mention. Again, sign up for Art of Gardening. It's going to be great. March 9th, and just visit the EICC.edu website and search Art of Gardening, and you can get registered there. But we are going to sign off with a little video that just talks a little bit more about what is Iowa State University Extension Outreach? And see you at Art of Gardening. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not the first extension professional to travel to the four corners of our state to visit with Iowans. It's not a new idea. Over a hundred years ago, Iowans asked the question, what if the research from Iowa State University could be put to work in a county? This became the extension idea, and we've been taking the land-grant university to people ever since. We engage Iowans in research, education, and extension experiences. That's our job. So we have to be aware of the needs of Iowans at all times. We also engage our researchers to look over the horizon, find new innovations, and identify emerging issues to help Iowans better prepare for the future. So we travel to each corner of the state and more to visit with people and talk about our state. We want to better understand the challenges Iowans face and how extension and outreach can help them address those challenges. Since Iowa State's early days, Iowans have wanted the university's research and education to be available in their own communities. Thus, Extension and Outreach was born to serve Iowans wherever they are and however we can help. We have an office in every county, an Extension staff and Extension councils working to meet the local needs. We take stock of those needs throughout the year as we meet with Iowans. Iowa State University Extension and Outreach started as an idea and we commemorate it on Iowa State campus and right here in Sioux County where the people first asked the question. And we've been taking land-grant university to the people ever since. Today, we're still listening and learning from each other and together, we'll build a strong Iowa. For now, it's time to get back to work. Iowa State University Extension and Outreach puts the university's research to work throughout the state. We work with farmers to conserve our land. We inspire youth.